Tori, I actually, um, if I seem a little out of breath, it's because I ran out right before I came on here because I had to run out and get myself a Starbucks. Girl, wanted to have a little toast. May all roads lead to Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> if only, if only every road in this universe led to Timothy Chalamet. Which I, I know, right? <laughs> well, I am so thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining us today. One of our great things about Beauty Uncovered is that we're always looking for different ways that we are looking for beauty in life. And part of that is a good, healthy financial life. And I have been obsessed with your channels for, I don't know how long, but for a very long time. (laughs) I share it with everybody. I have sent your podcast to every friend, including my sons, who I like to say I'm raising as a feminist. Um, and I wanted to know, I mean, first of all, what made you decide to get into this particular venue? Because I know that, I mean, you studied marketing, you've been through the corporate world. What made you to go into this route? Yeah. I mean, if you would have told me five years ago that this was the plan for my life, I would have laughed at you because yes, I studied marketing and theater in college, didn't study finance, didn't even study business technically, and thought I wanted to be a corporate marketer. And so I graduated college in May of 2016 with dual degrees in org com, marketing and theater and had this idea, this like fantasy of wearing pencil skirts to work and heels and having my Starbucks in my briefcase. And that's how I know it's a fantasy is I hate heels and hate pencil skirts. But that was the thought is I was going to be working my way up the corporate ladder. And within two weeks of my first corporate job, the, uh, that vision kind of faded. I realized that there was just a lot about the corporate life. I did not love including, but not limited to making people I didn't respect rich. And in me graduating college in 2016 and coming into like adulthood and womanhood, of course, not soon after I graduated, Donald Trump was elected president. And so I thought I was going to be coming into the world as a 22 year old in a country with its first female president, as I think a lot of us did. And of course that did not happen. And through conversations with friends and through, again, my own understanding of like making real money for the first time, trying to figure out how to navigate the world. I realized that I had a financial education from my parents that was in fact a privilege. I just thought that was the norm. I thought everybody knows how to not overspend on credit cards and everybody knows how to invest. And of course, realized very quickly that that wasn't the case. And so I became the kind of financial expert amongst my friends. And then when I peeled back the layers of personal finance, you start realizing, of course, that very, very little of the actual personal finance equation is individual choices. Absolutely. The majority of it is circumstantial, right? And so my mission of her first 100K was very much, uh, it very much began with these conversations of how do we give women these actionable resources to better their money as a form of protest? I don't think we have any sort of equality for any marginalized group until we have financial equality. And so working to pay off debt, save money, invest in order to get a financial foundation in a society that actively does not want you to have money. I also think that there is a separation of not just the feminist side of it, but also generational as well. I mean, granted, you know, I'm turning 50 tomorrow. (laughs) I'm older. Happy birthday. Thank you. (laughs) Great. Good. Drop the skincare routine, please. That would be great. Thank you. I'm excited. But I I think that, um, you know, when you look at, I mean, obviously some of the the people that are out there giving financial advice, such as Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman, it is a different type of thinking. It's a different way of really looking at life because the way that they grew their careers, the way that they grew their finances is completely different to the systemic things that we have in our lives now, which is the the, the, the student debt right. um, and a lot of other things that are against them. So that is one of the things I've always found fascinating about all of your content is you're really bringing that to the forefront. Well, we can't have conversations about money that ignore systemic oppression. And yet that's what we did for years, right? Is like those two experts you just named, right? I feel like Susie Orman does a better job at this than Dave Ramsey. Um, I am very public uh, in in my feud against Dave Ramsey and a lot of his advice because I think it's just really harmful for people. But yeah, it's like this lack of lack of systemic oppression, right? And it's very much continuing this bootstraps narrative that you know, oh, you will succeed. You will become rich. You will be a millionaire if you just work hard enough. And 
that not only is not true, that gaslights every single person who is working extremely hard yet cannot rise out of poverty. Right. And that's what I mean about the like 90% circumstantial, 10% individual choices is we have a lot of control over our personal choices. We have no control over our race, our gender, our, you know, uh, whether we had a financial education growing up from our parents, you know, we have so many other factors that we have to acknowledge when it comes to money and personal finance. And as soon as you like start peeling back the layers of the onion, like you're peeling layers of this onion forever. Right. And I'm in the midst of writing my first book, um, turning my manuscript here in, in a couple of weeks. And it's just crazy. Even me knowing so much about this space, just how, intertwined it all is. Um, and again, the realization that like, if we get more money into more women and other marginalized groups hands, the entire world starts to change. You get to leave toxic situations. You don't want to be in anymore because you have the financial standing to do so. You Mm. can donate to causes you believe in. You can start businesses or have children or not have children or get married because you want to get married, not because you're financially dependent on a partner, right? You can retire early. You have all of these options that open up to you when you have that financial stability and that financial foundation. Um, But it has to come with not just learning and navigating the personal finance world and learning how to pay off debt and learning how to save money. It also has to come with policy change. Do you find that as you're pulling the thread of all this, it's just stunning how much there is out there? Because as a woman that, I mean, (laughs) okay, so backstory, I married my first boyfriend. I was 18 when I met him. And from that moment now as a full grown actualized adult, I understand that I was being conditioned to believe that I was not good at finances. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, as I, you know, divorced, left with literally nothing, three kids that I had to take care of on my own, suddenly you're in this position where you're like, well, I'm I did not realize how conditioned I was. And it wasn't just him. It was society as a whole that was making it sound like, well, you know, you just do the best you can. And totally, it's more than that. It's way more than that. Yeah. um, It's these patriarchal narratives, right? So the most prominent one is talking about money is impolite, right? We get Mm. told that all of the time. Talking about money is taboo. You shouldn't ask somebody how much they make, right? We are literally more likely to talk about any other uncomfortable topic before we'll talk about money. We will talk about our sex lives. We will talk about death or politics or religion, right? We will literally have a conversation about basically anything else before we will talk about money. And that's not an accident, right? This whole talking about money is taboo narrative, and I'm putting it in quotes, that is a narrative perpetuated by the systems that keep you silenced, right? So if they tell you don't talk about money because it's taboo, that keeps you underpaid and overworked, Mm -hmm. right? So the patriarchy profits off of that silence. They profit off our inaction. Another one to your point is like, if you want to be good with money, you have to be good at math, right? Mm -hmm. Or like that there's some sort of, um, like degree or certification or like part of your brain that has to be good at money in order for you to be good at money. Again, I am a, can I curse on this podcast? Sure. Why not? (laughs) I'm a fucking theater major. Like (laughs) I should not be a financial expert. Right. But yet I am. Right. And so that was, you know, if I can do it, I promise you, you can figure out the basics of personal finance. Right. I know. I I was going to say, I was always told, Oh, you're not really good at math. I used to superimpose numbers, you know, stuff like, yeah. And it's also, it's also narratives of, again, of like, the financial system is built by men and for men, by cisgendered straight white men, right? For cisgendered straight white men. And so of course you don't feel like this environment is for you. I'm putting for you in quotes, right? Of course this doesn't feel accessible to you because you've been actively barred from, from gaining entry into the club, right? You have been gaslit and like Mm -hmm. this information has been gate kept from you for your entire life. So of course, finances feel intimidating. Of course, it doesn't feel like it's for you. And especially when we're, again, we're hearing these narratives, like talking about money is taboo. You should just work hard and that will, that will lead to all these opportunities. Right. Or the other one that really hurts women is that you shouldn't want money because that's greedy. Mm. That's one that gets perpetuated a ton. So if you want to get paid more, oh, well, you're just greedy and you're just ungrateful 
right? Or if you do want financial stability or if you do want nice things, that's frivolous and ridiculous, right? Me getting a manicure is frivolous, but men buying season tickets to their favorite football team is not frivolous. Right. Like make that make sense. Right. So it's like, again, all of these narratives, again, this onion, if we're peeling back layers of this onion, you realize how, how combined or how, um, yeah, the, just the intersection of all of these things and how these narratives are perpetuated again by a system that actively wants to keep you in the dark. It is amazing how, as I've, you know, I, like I always say, you know, I've grown in the past 10 years so much that it's like absolutely insane, Which but I, even, I know that. it's best 10 years of my freaking life. It's amazing. Yeah. But I think that what is, um, and what is really funny to me, because I, I do consider myself a feminist, I'm raising boys to really understand about their own personal responsibility as well with, with the whole entire conversation. Totally. But as I go along, I am actually quite stunned by the things that have, um, I don't know if you would call it generational, um, where I didn't even realize is, oh my gosh, that is a really, you know, Patronize. I don't know. Not patronizing, but paternalistic, masochist. I don't know, yeah, masochistic sure. at the very least. Um, thought process that um, I didn't even realize I was carrying. Yeah, and I think if you are, um, I can't speak to the experience directly, but in conversations with friends and conversations with clients, you know, it, it's even worse if you're like first gen in this country, right? If you're a first generational mm -hmm. American. Or if you have, you know, uh, parents who are immigrants to the United States, it's even, you know, again, it's it's like it, it's so nuanced to the point where it's like, you know, maybe, you know, as a white person. Right. I I have, again, had parents who were teaching me about money and that was a privilege. It was just a privilege to exist in a system where I understood vaguely what was going on. Right. It was mm -hmm. like, OK, I know what a bank is. I know what a social security number is. I know how to go about like cashing a check. Right. Um, or I know vaguely how taxes work sort of kind of right. Or I know who I can talk to in order to help me with my taxes. Right. If, if to your point about like generational, if you again, don't have parents or don't have grandparents who know anything about money, a or B, we're not even born in the country where you're now expected to navigate this system what are you supposed to do? Right. You're yeah. not taught about it in school. Again, if you don't have family members who understand it, they're not going to teach you. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of the people that we've turned to for many years, there was one in particular, Dave Ramsey, who would literally just shame you and judge you and tell you again, if you were not, if you were not rich, if you were not financially stable, that meant you were, you weren't working hard enough. That's right. A nice cycle of shame. Right. And that shame seeps in not just your own life, but seeps into, you know, your money story for generations to come potentially. So again, it becomes cyclical very easily where, yeah. And, and we look again, I could talk about this forever, but like we look in black and brown communities that are under or unbanked under or unbanked being they're either don't have access to a bank account and don't have one at all, or they're not taking like the full, uh, full use of their bank, right? Maybe they have a checking account, but not a savings account. And, um, we look at payday loan establishments, you know, places like money tree mm -hmm. that literally charge, I'm not kidding, 400% interest. Oh Lord. So let's put that in context, right? The average credit card in the United States is about 18% interest, which is already super predatory. A payday loan establishment to get like a thousand dollar loan is going to cost you about 300. I think it's 392% on average in the United States. And who is that affecting? largely black and brown people, largely unbanked populations, right? So again, as you peel back these layers, you realize like, oh, they either don't have access to a bank or distrust banks because banks have done nothing but, but screw over black and brown people forever, right? And so if you come from a family who does not know how to you know, navigate the financial system, does not trust the financial system, you won't trust the financial system either. Mm -hmm. And honestly, for probably good reason, right? So it, again, it's like, it's generational it's, it's systemic. It's related to your gender and your race and, uh, your sexual preference and all of these things. They're all related to money. And so that's why I believe I was put on this earth is we have to have conversations about money. We have to, again, not only couple personal decisions with policy change 
And that's for me, what financial feminism is, is it's like, I'm going to get my own financial shit together so that I can help everybody else. The act of me becoming financially stable in a society that actively does not want that for me is a form of protest. So I put my oxygen mask on first. I take care of myself. I'm good. And now I get to put my oxygen mask or I get to help others put on their oxygen masks. Right. And that's what I believe I was put on this earth to do. That is one of my mom's favorite sayings. Mm, like putting on the finance. putting on the that's airplane mask. Airplane yeah. Grace, she had 11 children. So you kind of had to do that. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, so I, mother. I gotta say, you know, I, I've listened to every single episode of your podcast. You have the second season out, but I always go back to one of the first ones. I think it might've even been the first one that um, really speaks to the basics that first startup stuff, you know, um, yeah. because there are a lot of people that are kind of like, well, I've heard this advice. I heard that advice. What yeah. I love is that you break it down. So um, logically of like basic, basic first steps that people should do. So what would you say is like, maybe for any of our listeners, what is the basic thing that they can start with aside from also listening to every single episode of your podcast? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you're referring to episode five which we talk about like, how do I start or the financial game plan of basically what do you do? I think I might've started with that one. And that's no, why. That's, I mean, it's, <laughs> it says, where do I start? So it makes sense. Mm. Um, yeah. So um, there's a lot of conflicting advice out there. Yeah. I am a big proponent of an emergency fund first. Mm -hmm. Even if you have debt, even if you have tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, especially around student loans, I need you to have an emergency fund first. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how much debt you have. Like I need you to have something in the bank should an emergency happen because it will. And we do that for two reasons. One, the mental stability and peace of mind that comes from knowing you have something in the bank. You mm -hmm. get to sleep better at night knowing that if there, there's an emergency, you lose your job, your cat gets sick, you get sick, something happens, right? You are covered or at least covered for a period of time. And the second thing is I don't want you going into more debt, trying to pay for an emergency, right? right? Or if you don't have credit card debt, I don't want you going into costly credit card debt to pay for that emergency. And the way you can start saving is what I call automate, like automating your savings, setting aside an automatic transfer from your checking account to your savings account. You can do this. Sometimes if you work a nine to five, you can work, uh, you can work to do this actually through your payroll platform. If mm -hmm. you go into your works payroll platform and say, okay, I want 10% of every paycheck or $200 of every paycheck put automatically into the savings account. You can also do this through your bank as you can say once a month or once every week, whatever you want this amount of money. Now, if you don't have a lot of money, that's okay. Start super small. Maybe it's 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month. One, again, a little bit of money in savings is better than nothing. And two, you're building your financial habit, right? So that when you are making more money or you are in a place where you can save more, you already have that like part of your brain, like wired to go. It's like, cool, I'm setting aside money every month. The reason we're doing it on autopilot is so we don't have to think about it. Right. It's happening without us having to think about it. And we're doing what's called paying yourself first. It's the like fancy way in the personal finance community of basically saying, even before you pay your rent, before you pay any of your bills, you are setting aside money for savings. Typically people wait to the end of the month to start saving. And then they wonder why there's no money there, right? They wonder why there's no money left over. So doing it first, paying yourself first, especially doing that on autopilot, it's going to happen without you having to even like click a button or think about it. If mm. you are setting aside more money to pay Netflix every month or HelloFresh or pick another subscription site, if you are giving them more money than you're giving future you every month, I'm not saying cancel your Netflix subscription. I'm just saying if you're giving a billion dollar corporation more money than you're setting aside for yourself, please remedy that because you deserve at least as much money as you're paying Hulu and HBO Max and I don't know, stars plus as you're paying. <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. I think that is a really great baseline. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the stuff that we were, uh, I was seeing about, you know, which credit cards to pay off first, you know, and right. talking about, you know, what the stock market makes year over year, as opposed to, you know, what you, your um, interest rates are on your credit cards. But 
you know, as we all know, right now, life is a little crazy, right? I mean, we have, you know, supply chain issues, a war. We have stock markets being crazy, gas prices. We got it all right now. Yeah, so I'm, I'm living in Los Angeles right now. I came down for a month and yeah, it's, uh, gas is 610 a gallon. Oh, no. a gallon. <laughs> Wild, crazy. Never seen it this high. Wow. So, I mean, we know that, like, I mean... I, at least, I, I mean, logically, we, we would think that that means that a lot of costs are going to start going up because gas prices are going up. I mean, things are really volatile right now. What do you say to people? I mean, it, it, you just got to think about putting aside even more, but you wouldn't necessarily, I don't know, do you go into the stocks or you don't? Yeah. I almost feel like it's so low right now. Isn't that a good idea to go in? So ultimately I actually got this question literally on my Instagram, like 10 minutes ago, which is like, hi, there's a lot of volatility in Ukraine and Russia right now. Is that a bad idea for the stock market? One, I think it's a really, really, I I do want to acknowledge it's a really privileged thing for us to even be considering how our stocks are going to be affected by a war that like we have no actual concept of. Right. Right. So that's the first thing is like, literally people are dying and uh, the fact that we even get to talk about how this affects our money and our, yeah, our, our lifestyle market allocation yeah. is, um, a huge privilege in and of itself. So I want to yeah. put that in context. The, to actually answer that question though, there's this lovely thing called dollar cost averaging. And that's a fancy jargony way of saying that basically if you put your money in today, it's going to level out over time because when mm-hmm. it comes to investing, we don't want to, I am a big proponent of long-term investing. Short-term investing is an oxymoron. Mm-hmm. It's not a thing. The word invest is to put, you know, the definition of the word invest is to put time, energy, money into something for a long period of time, right? To like dedicate yourself to something. And so when it comes to actually investing, you're looking at investing for a decade, two decades, three, four, right? You're looking at a long, long time, especially if we're thinking about retirement, which I think is the vast majority of, you know, w- the goal people are investing for. So you putting your money in on a random Thursday in March, which is when we're recording this, right? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what the price of things are. However, to your point of like things being cheaper, well, if there's a coat that I want and it's on sale, now might be a good time to buy it because it's cheaper than it would be normally, right? But that is, it's not, it's not a hard and fast rule. A lot of people call, no. do what they, they call timing the market. And again, I'm putting this in quotes. You yeah. can time the stock market. And anybody who says they know for a fact what the stock market is going to do is lying to you. None of us have any idea. We do know it will go up and it will go down. And when it goes down, like really down, it will recover because it's recovered every single time. And if for whatever reason it's not recovering, we have way more way bigger things to think about than the <laughs> stock market not Agreed. recovering. Agreed. So, yeah. If if uh you're worried about like yeah, the stock market's down today or the stock market seems to be down for a couple of weeks because of the impending war, um it it really honestly doesn't matter in terms of your money. It doesn't matter at what time you invest. It's more important that you get started investing as opposed to a letting analysis paralysis keep you from starting. So when it comes to retirement, I'm going to speak for myself, you know, uh, as again, a single mom. And I I would imagine there's a lot of women that are in this situation where they're starting over. They have started with absolutely nothing. They're working their tails off slowly putting a little bit away, get that three month, whatever it may be. Um, and raising their kids and kids are expensive. (laughs) So from there, I mean, you know, do you feel like it's almost not too late to, to, it's never too late, late, but like, do you ever like, what would you say to someone that's getting older and they're not like 20 something and you're saying, yeah, put a little aside for retirement. Suddenly you're in a situation where you're like, wow, I know for me, my biggest thing is that I would never want my children to ever feel a responsibility to have to take care of me. Mm. Um, They should be free of that. Our our relationship should never have to involve them having to make those kinds of decisions. It should just be us and our love. And that's it. So for me, I'm feeling that eminent. Ooh, I got to figure this out. What would you say to someone that's a little bit older? 
Yeah. Um, it is a complicated answer and it's an answer where I have to like basically give the tender reality, which is Mm. that, um, it sucks to start over Yeah, and it's not ideal. And again, this is why personal finance has to be coupled with policy change is if you don't have money to save, I honestly can't help you. And that's not because Mm. I'm not desperately trying to help you. Um, but like, that's the honest truth of it, right? Is it's like, if you don't have money to save, if you honestly don't have money to save at the end of the month, my advice is not helpful. Right. So even in, you know, me coming from a place of trying to be a personal finance educator comes with an element of like built-in privilege to that. What I will say is it's never too early and it's never too late. So if you are starting over and you are able to save money, ramp up your investing as much as you possibly can. So setting aside as much money for your retirement at this point as you can is super important because time is more important than the amount of money. And the more time we have on our side, so regardless of your age, getting started now is better than waiting a week or waiting a month or waiting a year. The other thing too, and I actually love that we talked about airplane finances earlier, is I talk with a lot of women who are older and they say, well, you know, I know I need to be saving for my own retirement, but I really don't want my kids to have to go into debt for anything, whether that's, you know, mostly it's like going into college debt. But I will say that unfortunately there is an option for students, or I guess fortunately, but unfortunately there is an option to take out a loan for school. You cannot take out a loan for your own retirement. No, that's not an option. So I, you know, nobody loves having to take out student loans. They're awful. However, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. And so, especially as mothers, right? Women are taught to sacrifice their own stability, sacrifice mm. their own love and their own, uh, their own resources for their children. And it's a beautifully altruistic thing, right? But at the end of the day, one, to your point, that's a really hard burden to leave your children with. Yeah. Is- I think I only came to that realization not long ago. Yeah. Um, where, cause it, it, the, the focus was on, you know, they're going to college now, you know, I don't want them to start their lives. I, it's exactly right. that argument. And it's, but a, then it, I sit there and think it's exactly on the, oh, I was going to say on the money. That's, just, that's a pun. <laughs> but no, it's like, it's, it, it's exactly a right impulse, which is like, I don't want you going into student loans because student loans are awful. They're, they suck. Right. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you cannot take out a loan for your own retirement. Like there is no retirement account loan option, right? There is an option for them to be able to go to college and, and potentially take out a loan, right? There is no loan for your own retirement and retirement is the biggest cost, the most costly thing you'll ever do. Even if you buy a house, even if you send multiple children to college, even, you know, sending yourself to college or a master's program, like it is the most expensive period of your life, the most expensive yeah. cost of your life. And especially for women, because we live on average seven years longer than men do. So we're taking less money because of the wage gap, right? It's growing at a slower rate because we're not investing at the same rate and we're expected to live longer on that money. So it is never too late to get started investing. It's never too early to get started investing, but thinking about, you know, prioritizing your own needs, especially if you are a wife or a mother, if you have other people to think about, that's beautiful. Please think about them. The world needs more empathetic people. However, you also really need to take care of yourself. I'm going to ask you one more question. <laughs> so going back over to the college debt, because I do think that's a valid question. Yeah. You know, nowadays, it, it, all right. So back when I was younger, you know, oh, college debt was the good debt. Right. That was the good debt. That was the debt that was investing in you. Granted, it was not as high. I mean, it was high, but it was not as high as it is now. It is doesn't have sixty thousand dollars a year. (laughs) No, no. So now we have a whole generation of people that are like, you know, you're you're having this debate of whether or not, I mean, short of people that are, you know, going to be doctors, lawyers, things that you have to have a degree. Do you really think that? college is a good investment anymore. I'm not the one to say. Mm. Um, and I answer that not as a cop out, but because I'm, I'm not going to try to come up with a bullshit answer for you. I'm not the person to tell you that. Um, I do think a bunch of people have been super successful, not going to college. I think a bunch of people have been successful going to college. I am so glad I went to college. Like I, I feel like not only did I learn a lot, but like I learned more outside of the classroom in terms of like how to interact with people, how to communicate well, 
learning more about myself and being independent. Like that was something that was really, really, really impactful. And I had the best four years in college. Like I loved my experience. Mm -hmm. I got the most out of that experience. Yeah. I dual degreed. I got two degrees, two bachelor's degrees in four years. I worked my butt off. I made some of the best French. Like I loved college. Um, ironically though, yes, I use my marketing degree all the time, but really like my day-to-day work, I learned more in my internships and in my call it like my on-campus jobs than I probably did in class. But mm. in class, like classes taught me how to be a good communicator, right. And how to be a better writer, um, and how to voice my opinions in a thoughtful way. And that I use every day. So for me, college was a hundred percent, a good choice. However, I'm the first to acknowledge that in addition to my three jobs on campus, in addition to merit scholarships, my parents were able to help pay for college. They were Mm. able, they had set aside a little bit of money to help make this process easier. And we scraped by, by the skin of our teeth without going into debt. It was like, wow, we were so close. (laughs) Literally we sat down my senior year and we're like, can we do it? I think we can, I think we can do it. Okay, cool. Um, so I, again, that was a privilege. That was a massive privilege. Um, So of course I can look back and be like, this was hundred percent a great decision for me because I'm not saddled with student loan debt. However, I do think if you are using college or a master's program, I especially see this with master's programs as a, I don't know what I want to do with my life. So I guess I should just go to college. Please don't do that. Right. If you are 17, 18, this is unfortunately like not very common in the United States, but super common in European countries take a gap year. I've seen a ton of people do this, especially yeah. with COVID because like the college experience is not the college experience. No, now. it's not. So it's like, as opposed to going to, to online school at, you know, a major four-year university or, a, you know, getting a four-year degree and paying $50,000 for online school, maybe take a gap year, right? Maybe go volunteer somewhere, maybe get a job for a little bit. You know, if you again, have the flexibility to do that, but, um, if you are using college or further education as like, uh, like you stalling, or you just being like, I'll figure it out. Like maybe reconsider that decision because what's going to happen is you're going to go in debt trying to figure that out. Right. No, I completely agree. The vast majority of 18 year olds, of course, do not know what they want to do. Um, and so be strategic in that decision. Maybe it's going to community college. Maybe it is going to a four year college, but only taking like your general classes for the first year and then going and exploring other things. Right. Just don't, I remember, yeah, being 18 and being like, I knew $50,000 was a lot of money, but I had no actual grasp of how that's how much money that actually was. Right. And so, I mean, again, we could talk about this forever about like the audacity that these organizations have to, you know, corner a 17 year old in sweatpants and be like, sign this form. Basically that's going to put you $200,000 in debt. But um, just if you're using that as just like the next step, maybe rethink that decision or think through if there's a better option, even if that option is not the one that's been like provided to you. Well, I have to say that um, all of my coworkers are very jealous right now. I have been told to say hello from Brittany, from Ashley. Oh, oh my, my God. God. So you're going to talk to her today. Please say <laughs> hi from Brittany. <laughs> So sweet. Oh, hello. We're all That's big so fans. Kind. Oh my goodness. We're all That's big so fans. Kind. Well, you know, we all oh, here of it all the plex, like 70% of us are women. Actually, yeah. I think it might be even more. So uh yeah, we, we're all big fans. And thank, thank you, you so much for coming on. Really thank appreciate it. Me. Thank you for having me.